Data Agency Affairs Board CPD session. I'm Sonia de Toe, a director at MCF and Abarg Attorneys. We are a firm specializing in conveyancing and property law. But let's get started. Today I'm talking to you about subdivision, consolidation and rezoning. But before we get to that, we need to get to the definition of property law. If we look at a full title property, we are talking about the synonym where the full title gives you full rights and the sectional title gives you right to that section um, which you own as an owner. If there are, for example, 10 sections, you have full right and title to your section. But if we then talk about rights, we're talking about sovereignty. So you have comprehensive rights to your property, but no rights are absolute. So when you own a gun, you may not go around shooting people. When you own a car, you have to comply with the traffic laws. And just the same, we have uh, restrictions when you own immovable property. So what will restrict your rights or place limitations on your right as an owner of property? It might be legislation, for example, environmental legislation, and from that will flow town planning scheme and zoning regulations. It might be that your deed of title, which is your document of ownership, places certain restrictions on you. For example, it might say that you may only build one property on your stand. And then, of course, there may, may be HOA or Home Owners Association regulations. And if you're an owner in a sectional title scheme, then you will have sectional title rules applicable to you, which will limit your rights in your property. Today, we are focusing on one of those specific limitations, and that's the town planning scheme and the zoning that flows from that town planning scheme rules. So if I say my ownership is restricted, then it's going to restrict it by some kind of act or some kind of uh, town planning scheme. Let me quickly explain a town planning scheme to you. The town planning scheme is what the municipality envisage for a specific area um, over which they uh, then determine which area will have industrial, where would be residential, where would the agricultural holdings be, and how that will develop over the years, where will the major roads be situated. So each municipal area has their own town planning scheme, and in that town planning scheme they then have different zonings. Uh, they may have a zoning for residential one, which is only one house per stand. They may have industrial areas where industrial zoning is applicable. So my zoning will limit my right to my property. It will say I can do this, but I can't do something else. I can reside there, but I can't trade there or have a retail facility there. So that's my zoning. But each zoning also has a development control link to it. So if I have a guest house, my development control will be that I should have so many parkings for each room that I have. That will all be set out in my town planning scheme rules and then specifically allocated to my zoning of that property. Another concept in your development control would be your floor area ratio. There would be a rule which states that you have to build a, in a certain footprint over the totality of the area of the earth. Say, for example, your first story is 100 squares, your second story is also 100 squares, and the totality of your property from border to border is 500 squares, then the floor area ratio would be determined by dividing your 200 squares by your 500 squares, and then you get uh, to a total which is then, say, for example, 0.4, and that's your floor area ratio. Another development control would be your coverage. Coverage would be your bird's eye view from the top. So if my first story is 100 squares, my second story is 100 squares, if I look from the top, I'll only see the 100 squares. And my coverage would then be my 100 squares divided by my 500 squares, and that would give me a percentage, and that's my coverage. So in your development controls, it would say, 
for this property, so much may be covered and I may not build bigger than that percentage. And then our density, how many units per hectare can we build on this specific property? And there's also then prescriptions about parking and about how many stories you go, go, can go up in a residential area. They don't want a five-story building um, as a general rule. So we establish our zoning in two ways. The first way is originally when we proclaim the township in which this property is situated. Or later on, we can rezone the property. So my ownership restriction is as follows. When I own a property, I can only do what my zoning tells me I can do. If I live in a normal suburb, I can't now all of a sudden manufacture anything from my residential unit. I can't go around and do retail, and I can't have a business that I do from that property. If I want to do that, what should I do? I should approach the municipality and I should ask them that we can rezone this property. So when we talk about zonings, if you look at your slides, you will see different kinds of zoning. You, for example, have residential one, two, and three, where residential one may say that it's only one unit or one dwelling on a total stand. And when you go to residential two and three, you may be able to build more than one uh, house or dwelling unit on that specific stand. Then you also have industrial zonings, that would be your manufacturing areas, uh, and then you have business zonings, business one, two, three, and four, and that will cater for from a small business, small business park, up to big office blocks. Right, so after we look at our zoning, then we know that we change our use rights to become something else so that we can use it for the purpose that we want to use it for. Now that we know the definition, we're going to look at where does the zoning come from in terms of le legislation. And it's handled on three levels, national level, provincial level, and municipal level, local government level. If we look at our national level, we are now looking at our Spluma Act. This is a brand new act that everybody has to take note of because it's national and regulates the whole of the country. SPLUMA stands for Spatial Planning and Land Use Management Act, but we, we are going to talk about that a bit more a bit later. And then on a provincial level, SPLUMA now determined that each province must have their own piece of legislation, which has the same principles as SPLUMA and which guides that specific, specific province. So for instance, in the Western Cape, we have the Western Cape Land Use and Planning Act, or LUPA, and then from provincial level, it goes to local government level. And on local government level, each and every municipality must create a bylaw. So the bylaw is if you want to rezone today or you want to establish a township, you go to the municipality and you have a look at their bylaws. That's the bottom line. That's where you start and see how you can rezone this property and how you can get new rights to use your property. Before Spluma, just a bit of background, there was chaos. Each province had their own ordinance, each municipality had their own rules and bylaws, and there was no coherency or working together in a uniform manner. And that is why Spluma was introduced. So Spluma now creates uniformity and coherent spatial planning. So from the top down, we have one set of rules now guiding our spatial planning and, and township development uh, processes. So when did Spluma come into operation? It started on 1 July 2015, but of course that was now on a national level. And now it's down to each and every province, and they are now step by step all implementing their bylaws. Cape Town was first. They also implemented their bylaws on the 1st of July 2015, so they're far ahead and they're already well into their new Spluma regulations and bylaws. Uh, Free State and Gauteng is in the process, and the Gauteng province instituted their bylaws in Twane on the 2nd of March this year, and so that's brand new for them, and we're now starting with all these new processes, which were, was initiated by, by the Spluma Act. 
So now that you know where it comes from, we're going to get into the process. If you want to rezone your property, you are going to approach a town planner. A town planner will then assist with the whole process within municipality. Your town planner will look at a few things. The first which is of is, what is the current zoning? What may we do? Is it not enough for you in terms of what you want to do on your property? If it's not enough, we're going to rezone. And then he's going to look at the spatial development framework. What does the municipality envisage for this area in which you are staying? They aren't going to allow you to all of a st sudden start a manufacturing business if their future idea for this suburb is to stay residential. And then we have a look at your title deed. That is your document which says you are owner. If we look at that document, there may be conditions in there which says that you may not build two units or two houses on this specific earth. And then we need to take out those conditions with a different and separate process. So the town planner will look at those three um, issues and if he's happy then start the process of rezoning. So it's a six step process. Uh, the first which of is advertising it. So what happens is you advertise it in two of the lo local newspapers, you advertise it in the Provincial Gazette, and you place a notice at the property, usually on the gate or somewhere where it's noticeable. And the information that you get is what is the current rezoning, what you want to rezone it to, and you invite public participation. And the objections can be lodged and where it must be lodged. All the neighbors in your area must also consent and they can, can also object to your rezoning. Once you've advertised, the town planner will now compile your application, which it needs to be lodged at the municipality. So the application consists of a few documents. Obviously, he wants to provide proof that he's lodged that advertisement. You need to pay a fee for your rezoning application and also a motivation letter. Your motivation letter will, for example, say why we want this rezoning, how's it going to fit into the spatial planning of the area, why it, it should um, be considered favorably, and what would the impact be on the environment, and what would the impact be on my neighborhood. Then also the conveyancer will lodge a certificate, and the conveyancer will then say there are no uh, negative conditions that need to be taken out, and also the, a copy of the title deed will be lodged. There will also be plans that the architect will see to, so an architect will be involved in this process. The plans will indicate the location and the, the situation of the buildings currently on the property, and also if we rezone, for example, we're now going to have a guest house on this property of mine, how will I accommodate the development controls? Where will the additional parkings be? How will I include all the services here, the stormwater, the, the electricity, um, and how that is all going to be handled? That will be indicated on the plan that the architect provides. So if we have compiled all the documentation and it's been lodged at the municipality, the next step is that it is circulated through the municipality. The municipality has six departments through which it will circulate. And each of the, those departments will look at the application and they will give their comments. Do they support this re rezoning or do they not support it? And if they have negative comments, we will see how we handle that a bit later on. But the basic departments through which it's circulated is the services infrastructure, for example. How will we provide enough water and electricity to this upgraded rezoning usage of this property? The transport department, services infrastructure department also looks at your application and, for example, they would look at the geology. They may even ask you to do a geological report to see if there's not dolomite in this area. If you're going to build stories up, it's important to know if there's dolomite in your area. Also the roads. Am and I all of a sudden going to do business on this property and instead of two vehicles driving down this road, there are 50 vehicles driving down this road every day. That will be a comment that they will make and say that you need to upgrade the road or provide for a splay in the road, whatever is needed. The health department comments, 
the environmental department makes a comment, and then city planning also throws in their bits on behalf of the spatial planning plan. Do they see that this can work in this area? And obviously group legal services oversees the whole process in terms of coordinating all the comments, getting it back, and seeing that it's all put together in one uh, document to give feedback to the town planner and the client. Four of the rezoning process is that the bulk services contributions are calculated. Bulk services contributions is the amount of, of fees and funds this, the council envisage is needed to upgrade the infrastructure. For example, the stormwater. Um, now all of a sudden there's no more grass. This is going to be a business area. Where is all that stormwater going to go to? Is there enough electricity to now provide for much more for this business park? And how will the roads handle this? And in actual fact, the municipality needs to in upgrade this total infrastructure. And for that, they ca calculate a bulk services contribution uh, that the applicant must pay to the council. Some of these upgrades, unfortunately, do not happen immediately. Some of them never happen, but you still need to pay your bulk services contributions before your building plans for this new use and zoning that you envisage will be approved. And the drawback of not paying your bulk services contributions is then obviously your building plans won't be approved. And secondly, um, your bulk services contributions will increase every year by a certain percentage. So the sooner you pay it, the better. So if we know then what we should pay, the next step is your feedback and approval stage. So each of the department has now given you feedback, it's consolidated into one document, and your client now receives that document in which it is set out what the conditions are and that it is approved. This application is now um, finally approved by the Municipal Planning Tribunal. That is new in terms of Spluma. Every municipality has, must have a municipal planning tribunal. And if you do not agree with their final feedback to you, you can go to the municipal appeal tribunal, which is also new in terms of Spluma. And every municipality has such a tribunal. So the process is much more structured and the appeal process made easier in terms of the new legislation. After you then have feedback and approval, your last step is your publication. You now, again, promulgate in the Provincial Gazette that this is now not a residential one, for example, property anymore, but it's now a business one property. And then you are at the end of your total rezoning process. The estimated costs for this whole process is around about from anywhere from 60 to 81,000 Rand and that does not e include your bulk services contribution, contributions. So as you see, it's quite expensive to go through this whole rezoning exercise. Now that you know what rezoning is, the second process I wanna take you through is your subdivision process. First of all, what is subdivision? It's the process through which one earth is divided into more than one piece. It can be two, five, or how many ever is allowed by the municipality and the size of the property um, it can be subdivided into. So if I have an earth of a thousand squares and I want to divide it in two, I can have portion one of my earth and I will have a remainder of my earth after I'm done with the whole process. It's also done through an application process, application to the local municipality, and then the town planner handles that, but he also has help from an architect, engineer, a land surveyor, and a conveyancer in the end. Because remember, we need to, in the end, come to a title deed, a document that your client has in his hands, in which it says he is now owner of portion one, or he is now owner of a remainder. So it's not with, like with rezoning where we stop, where we publish this, and everybody now knows that it's now zoned for a different zoning. We need to get to a physical new document that your client has in his hand, which is registered at the deeds office, and that's why you need a conveyancer if you subdivide. So if your client approaches you and he says, no, I did my subdivision at the local authority, and he cannot show you his new title deed, his subdivision is not yet finalized. In terms of what legislation do we subdivide? 
once again, national level, provincial level, and local authority level. And SPLUMA is my deciding act on a national level, flowing down to the municipal bylaws again. What influences my subdivision? Once again, my town planner is going to look at the same three issues. First of all, the town planner will look at three factors once again to determine whether this will be a favorable subdivision. What the current zoning is, what the spatial development plan for this area is. In certain areas, for example, they won't allow a subdivision where after subdivision your earth is smaller than a specific percentage. If you have a thousand square earth, it might be that they say that they don't allow any subdivisions smaller than 600 square meters. So then your subdivision will not be approved by the local municipality. And once again, they look at your title deed. If you want to subdivide now and build more than one property on it and there's a restrictive condition, that condition must be deal dealt with in this whole process up to subdivision. So the steps for subdivision is the rezoning process and then four more steps included into that. So the first of which is an engineer services report by the engineer. Why do we need this? We now have one earth and when we're done here we want two stands. It might be that we only have electricity connection in this one corner. How will electricity be dealt with for this second portion that we're now creating? And the same for all the services. So we need an engineer to determine where are my services located on my property currently and how are we going to amend that to accommodate two stands after we're done with this subdivision. And that is all contained in a report which contains all the services and it costs about 35,000 Rand and it takes about two to three weeks for my engineer to compile. After we know what my engineer has to say about my services, I then need to go and either decide, do I do a rezoning together with the subdivision process or am I fine with the current zoning? So if my current zoning allows for this, this subdivision and it's fine within the UC trust that I want to, after this is subdivided, then we can proceed. If it's not in order, I must also now see to the rezoning together with the subdivision process. And then we go jump back to that six step process in which we advertise and go through the whole process of getting my property rezoned. So if you have a look, you go through the advertisements and then I have a new stage here. It's a geotech report that's included now into my system of my six steps of rezoning. Why do we do geotech report uh, by a geologist at this stage? I have one large stand, I want to subdivide it. We need to know that after subdivision, there's not soil and ground conditions that will prohibit me from building a new dwelling on this one part and the existing dwelling is already on that part, so that's not a problem. But if there's dolomite in my area, your municipality will definitely require a geotech report that needs to be submitted to the Council for Geoscience to have a look at and to approve your subdivision and probably later on to allow you to build on that property. So my geotech report is, uh, has costs in the range of 40,000 to 80,000 rands and takes about four months. So it's a lengthy and expensive process to get to that. Then the process of subdivision continues. So I've advertised, I've got my geotech report and now I'm lodging my application, I'm circulating, I'm paying my bulk services contributions, I'm getting my feedback and approval, and I'm promulgating it in the Provincial Gazette. So that's then step two. I first of all got my services report, I've gone through my rezoning, and now I have to get plans. Who's going to supply me with those subdivisional diagrams that I need to identify this is portion one and this is the remainder? This is going to be a surveyor. A surveyor will go out to the property and measure the two portions that you want to end up with and he's going to draft a plan only indicating the borders. We're not now talking about indicating all the current structures. We're only saying how will this look in terms of the borders of this property. 
he's drafting it and then he's lodging it at the surveyor general's office for approval only once the surveyor general's office which is a public office has approved this plan and dated it and signed it i have a subdivisional diagram with which i can work the time frame is around five to eight weeks the cost is about nine thousand to fifteen thousand rand to draw up a subdivisional diagram now we sit with a property which we have a diagram and which we have approval from the municipality that we can subdivide if you look at it, your example one and your example two you will see a typic, typical subdivisional diagram of which it will indicate portion one and then the balance thereof is your remainder now the next step and that is step four in my subdivision process is my installation of my services the engineer now said I need another electrical connection this side, I need a new sewer connection there, and now I have to install those services before I can proceed with my subdivision because we cannot transfer a property which is not serviced. I can't now give transfer to another person and when he gets there he has no electricity. So we install the services next as step four. The next process is the registration of the subdivision in the deeds office. For that, you need a conveyancer. The conveyancer is going to lodge the current title deed, he's going to lodge the subdivisional diagram, and he's also going to lodge a consent by the municipality. The municipality has now inspected all the services that I have installed. They've given a certificate which says everything is in order in terms of the municipality side because the deeds office can't register that subdivision before they know what is happening and that all the conditions have been complied with which the municipality has set out for the subdivision. Once we register that subdivision in the deeds office, if you go into the deeds office and you do a deed search, you'll see there's a portion one and there's a remainder. Or there may be a portion one, two, and three and a remainder. There will always be a remainder. But then you know that this subdivision is completed. So if you do a deed search and you can't find a specific portion, you must know that this subdivision is not yet completed. It might be anywhere in those steps of the subdivision. So the total, when you look at a subdivision process, can go anywhere from 80,000 to around about 110,000 uh, 110, rand, depending on the bulk services contributions, which still needs to be added onto that. When we talk about subdivision, there is also an alternative to subdivision, which a client can consider. And that's your application for a second dwelling to be built on the property. So you might want a, uh, want a client to subdivide and have two separate entities, but your client may also just want to build a second dwelling on the same property. For example, his mother wants to come and live with him and he wants to build a granny flat. Then he will apply for a second dwelling consent use to the municipality. And funnily enough, it's exactly the same process as you follow for your rezoning only it's the, the the name changes to include second dwellings so in that case you're going to have one title deed but you're going to have two houses on your property but it's much the same process as your rezoning process what we end up with then in the end is one property and another may be built on the property and that consent use for a second dwelling is often utilized where developers want to build a duet on the property. So that's a sectional title scheme with two units on it, but there's no definite border between the properties um, in which each have a, has a part of the stand. So that's your second dwelling consent use. The last aspect I want to talk about this today is the consolidation of properties. So if I talk about consolidation, my definition would be where I take individual properties and I combine them into one larger property. It's also done through an application process. You start off at the municipality and your town planner, and then you have a surveyor which assists you. And in the end, you have a conveyancer once again is going register to that, register that new title into your name so that when you have a look at the deed search, you can see there's a title deed in which this person has this large earth registered in his name, his or her name. 
when we ask ourselves the question in terms of what acts do we do the consolidation, once again, we go back to national, provincial and local government level. So it's once again Spluma for the process nationally, the provincial laws and the bylaws at the municipality, which regulate this whole consolidation um, process. There are certain requirements before you consolidate a property. Obviously, it needs to be next to each other. You can't consolidate a property here, have your neighbor's property and then want to consolidate it with the one next to that. The ownership must be in the same person's name. My neighbor and I can't decide that we now want to consolidate our two properties into one nice large property. I have to take transfer of my neighbor's property so that it's in my name and then we can proceed. It must also be in the same province and in the sound, same township. So if there are two properties, but one is situated in Alderain Extension 1 and one is situated in Alderain Extension 2, we are not going to be able to consolidate these two properties. It needs to be in the same township. And lastly, it must have the same zoning. So once again, zoning can be pulled into this whole process. If one is residential one zoned and the other one is zoned for business, I'm not going to be able to consolidate this before I have made this residential one also a business one or whatever the case may be. The process for consolidation is a bit quicker and easier. It's a town planner who lodges the application first off and submits it to the council and the council then approves the application. And then in the meantime, the surveyor can draft the consolidation plan. And that consolidation plan is once again approved by the Surveyor General's Office. And we get a formal diagram as shown in example four of your um, examples, in which it sets out all the components. So it's, for example, Earth 1, 2, 3, and 4, now consolidated to become Earth 5. And all the conditions and servitudes is also indicated on this diagram. The diagram takes about eight weeks to draft, to lodge at the Surveyor General and to get it approved. And that plan then goes to the conveyancer because the conveyancer then uses it as step four to register that consolidation in the deeds office. So what does the conveyancer do with that consolidation diagram? The conveyancer prepares a certificate of consolidated title. That's gonna be your document that you take home and which proves the, the consolidation has successfully been finalized and also my diagram, otherwise the deeds office can't see what I'm consolidating now. The reason why we don't have a services report with a process of consolidation is as follows. We now have four urban, which is gonna become one stand. So there are already services of each of those urban. So it's not necessary for me now to have an engineer come out and see if there's enough electricity, is there enough stormwater capability? Because I already have all these abundant services which is now combined into one service. So it's an easier process than your subdivision process where I may need additional services. So after the surveyor uh, and the deeds office has approved it, your consolidation process is then finalized. The cost for a consolidation is in the area of about 10,000 to 17,000 rand um, and that's just an estimate which we uh, give our clients. Hope you found this session informative and please remember to complete your multiple choice questions to earn your CPD points for this session. Mm -hmm.